The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. I'm Dale Pinkert. Welcome back to FACE on ECD Day. Hello, Patrick. B. Coons, Hassel. No. Did you catch alongside of crude? So everyone's listening to uh, Draghi having its press conference. How are you, Chris? Arianto? Everyone doing okay? So this is what I see in the Euro. Drive one, drive two. I'd like to see one more shot up towards 109.80. Um, uh, interesting look from Nick. A, B equals C, D at 109.80, which actually would be a new high in a third drive up here. Congratulations on that, Hasselhoff. Who wears short shorts? Anyone in here? Yeah. Okay, so uh, I, I do want to take a look at Canada here. A lot of these are in the same setup. I'd like to see one more shot up in Canada too. Here's one. Here's two. RSI over 70 on the last drive. I'd like to see one more push. It could be a failing rally, but I'd wait for one more push. It looks like a lot of things are setting up for sell in May and go away. Early May, some turning points may happen. I just want to cover the oil too, because uh, from yesterday, got a 100 pip rally from the 902 level. And on the four hour, we're still diverging. I have no signal, but we are at major support here in the crude. The four hours diverging, the one hour isn't. So I would key a buy in crude off a of one more drive in Canada. There'd be nothing wrong with probing it uh, with a partial position at major support at eight and a half. I still believe that before we take out these lows here, that there's a rally coming back to 51, 5150. So you could put a, a piece on here and if it breaks to 48, put on another piece and you're wrong under the low. You don't want to sit with it under the low. So this could still be happening. Maybe we have to go to 48 so Canada could drive up there one more time. So we're closing in on our first month of FACE. I have a great interview today with Mark Newton. Uh, Mark's interviewed on CNBC quite a bit. They bring him on. He's an excellent technician. How are you, Dan? See, you scalped that uh, Canada for 100 points. 36.50 was a good number, Hardianto. Nice call on that. There was also a uh, recent update on the euro here. I believe it was basic technical. Here we are. Showing the 61.8 back, uh, perhaps it's a right shoulder. So it's our hope here at Forex Analytics that this free room has been helping you. Hi, Ziggy, how are you, my friend? And the way to say thank you, if you're winning and learning over the last month here with us at Forex Analytics is to become a subscriber. So we get lots of good looks from the community and the team and occasionally from me. So although premature looking for a top in Guppy, I think I've made a couple suggestions this week. The crude yesterday at 9.02, the Aussie and Kiwi from, uh, from Monday, which was here in the Kiwi. 
I I wouldn't be short the Kiwi anymore. We're start we got a little two driver here. Could even be counter trend, and that's a weakness. Aussie looks a little heavier. Actually, Kiwi looks a little better right here. So uh, the Aussie was a nice suggestive short from 75.60 or so. There's 100 pips. Oh, well, welcome to the team, B. Thank you, Hardy Anto. Oh, well, congratulations, Ziggy. I'm so glad for you. You'll be babysitting quite a bit. So Blake is uh, going to jump in here in a little bit. He's probably watching. It's a press conference on now with Draghi. Anyone know what Draghi's saying? I think I know what Draghi is saying. He's saying, I want to make the economic pizza pie a bigger for everybody. I want to make the pizza better, bigger for everybody in Europe. Uh, we do a little more QE. I don't like the gap that we had on a Monday in the Euro on the French election. Glad you like it, Patrick. Well, that's a compliment. He was a great actor, wasn't he? <laughs> so let's keep our, keep an eye on the euro. Also, I do want to point out for all you cable bulls here, what kind of high is this in the cable right here? Those of you that have been following me here. Risk averse. Risk on means you're buying everything. Everything's going up. Risk off is everything's going down and you want to be in cash. Anyway, no, it's a, uh, it's a non-confirmation and it's the first one. See this, see this, everyone see that RSI reading? That's a confirmed high, we moved sideways, we made a new high, and it's still a pretty good reading, but it's lower than it is here. Here's the picture. basically a lower high here. See that? First divergence. 130 is your number. Well, you could get that, Dan, because we could pull back here and then drive up one more time. It's only the second. So, on the second drive, it's a warning to not be long. It's not a reversal. Daily. Everyone get that? Daily. Is that you, Blake? It's me. Oh, hi, Steve. Good morning. How Hello. are you, buddy? Fine. Um, a short comment uh, about uh, Draghi, by the way. Okay. Uh, and a short comment about the Euro pairs um, that we were talking the past few days. Uh, we also, I need to tell you that we have Grega joining in, so he's going to give us some uh, Elliott Wave insight before we get uh, Blake attending. So we have quite a lot of things today. We have Grega, we have uh, Blake, and later on you have your uh, excellent guest, which I'm looking forward to uh, hearing. Okay, I Steve. think it's, um, it's a good idea if I give a pass to Grega to talk about the Europers. I briefly wanted to say that today, and depends on how the... Uh, how the rest of the press conference plays. We see the potential of uh, reversals in the several euro pairs I said I was uh, bullish. Uh, so that means that we might get an opportunity during the next uh, 
few days to you know to to join the upside because as I said when I presented them, the risk reward was more, uh, the risk reward was not there anymore. But I think we might get that opportunity within uh, the next week or the week after that. Um, we see a shooting star already in the Euro Aussie on the daily. I mean, we see already a spinning top on the. Uh, you want to show it, Steve? Sure. Before I put Gregor on. Gregor, sure. Gregor, Gregor can you hear us, by the way, mate? Yes. I know. Sure. I see that. Okay. I, okay. He can hear us. So yeah, I can I can show them briefly, and then Gregor can. Uh, uh, can take over people's votes or whatever else uh, he wants. All right, go ahead. I'm making you the presenter now, Steve. Yeah. Yeah, and you, I do recall you saying uh, that things were a little bit too stretched and we needed to see some type of pullback to get on board. So uh, uh, good instinct. Maybe the setups are going into next week. You know, we're ending the month here. Look at this. Uh, sometimes, you, sometimes you see uh, setups uh, occurring and reversals occurring into the beginning of May. So go ahead, buddy. Euro Kiwi, spinning top at the moment in this very important zone. You see, we have, we have had tops, we have, have had bottoms, we have had many retests in the past. So, of course, it's too early in the day. So, you know, everything I say, take it with a pinch of salt. I'm always waiting for daily closes. Here it is. We have a shooting star in the Euro Aussie. So a retest perhaps of around 143. Uh, if we get there or a retest of this descending uh, wedge somewhere here because obviously the test is not going to happen today to, to go right. all the way here it might it might do something like this and we retest it somewhere here where currently the 200 DMA is at around 143.50 we also had a huge candle from Eurocad let's have a look at it you see a, a yeah. long week worn here uh, yesterday we we dropped uh, lower, but we recovered. Today we seem to be trying to uh, to move lower again, as it seems this is also a stretched market, perhaps a gap fill uh, or um, a test of 146 roughly, which was this high. So you know I'm I'm monitoring the pairs and I'm gonna you know keep you informed of. Uh, how they move and yeah. when we can uh, we can look into. And I think them. I know your I think I know your style by now, Steve. You don't trade these things counter trend because there's no guarantee there'll be a correction. So why even attempt it? Is that correct? Uh, yes, I, it's actually because usually I refer from taking short term uh, trends. That's the reason. Okay, Otherwise, right. I wouldn't uh, mind so much. Uh, by okay. the way, I need to. Blake has has taken us over this uh, pair plenty of times in the past. This is yeah. Euro pound. As it seems, we're yeah. turning lower again. Um, so you remember that both Blake and I had said that, you know, we, we didn't mind staying in the in the pair and losing some of the profits as long as we, we still believe in it and we still believe in it. And today we're seeing uh, a move uh, toward 0 0.84 again. Now, having to do with Draghi's comments, I don't know uh, how many heard. I heard most of them until we went on the webinar. The general idea with Draghi is that he's trying at the same time to persuade people that everything is okay with the Eurozone structurally. I mean that the Eurozone is not in any kind of danger of disintegration or whatever. So his hawk is in whatever has to do with the integrity of the common uh, currency and the Eurozone. But on the other hand, he's trying to play, to play down the potential of uh, um, uh, further tapering than what, whatever is already agreed by showing that the bank wants to be accommodative for as long as possible, showing that the, um, the risks to inflation uh, are still there, etc., etc., etc. So, uh, you know, uh, as it seems, they, they are more upside. They said that they're more upside about the economy and the recovery of the economy. But on the other hand, they're trying to give as many excuses as possible um, for participants to understand that uh, they shouldn't uh, take, um, uh, you know, um, uh, softly the possibility that the bank will stay accommodated for longer. Obviously, they do not want uh, euro appreciation. Personally, I, I've told you that my look on the euro is uh, <coughs> positive on a medium to long term, and uh, that hasn't changed from today's conference. But I think uh, it's, it's, it's a good opportunity for Greg to, to share his uh, charts and everything else. So you want to uh, pass the ball to him? Sure. Okay, I'll do it. I'm all yours. No. I just made you actually a presenter. Just choose your screen. Okay. 
Okay, just let me know when it's, we will see it. Can you Mr. see? Gregor, we can see. Yes. Can you see my I, screen? Yes, mate. I can. We can, can see your can. screen. Ah, okay, perfect. Uh, so actually, I will co cover the stuff as you know, serious that when we discussed on the meeting about this 10-year US notes moves and how I think that they are only in a corrective bounce. So I will just give some of the background. Just, just to put the viewers in uh, in the whole debate, we were talking about Grega. Grega was showing us how correlated the 10-year uh, US Treasuries are with the Euro USD. That's why he believes that Euro USD is going to move lower. And then we had them. Um, uh, a constructive debate about how the movement is also is, is mostly um, uh, determined by the differentials. Uh, I think also Mark talked about it yesterday. The differentials of uh, the bonds and the treasuries. So it that it does I not. I think he used the two year. He is. I think he mentioned he yes, looked at yes, the two year. He's looking at the two year. He said that yes, he believes it's mostly correlated. That's yeah. correct. Yes. So actually, always. Um, when I'm looking at the markets, I'm looking clearly from a technical perspective, okay? And I, I just don't really care um, what fundamentals are because I think that a market is always ahead of fundamentals. So uh, if I look on this Euro-Dollar weekly chart, I really do not see uh, a reason why would I fight this falling downtrend, even if I believe that market will potentially turn to the upside, let's say, in the next 12 months. but uh, based on the structure that I see from the last few months, I don't think we are going uh, higher yet. So the reason, there are a few reasons why I should remain uh, on the bear side for the euro dollar. So first one, as I said, because larger trend is still down. The second one is because this bounce from the lows is in three waves or in seven legs if you go into details, but still in both cases it's a corrective movement. The next thing that uh, is very worrying for me is those gaps. Now, if you're if you're tracking forex uh, for some time now, then you know that those gaps will very rarely be open. So normally they will get filled, but it's just a question of time. Now, usually some small gaps will be filled in the 24 hours or maybe even earlier on Sunday. While if they stay open for more, uh, let's say more than two days, then normally they will get filled uh, maybe in two weeks. Okay, so. This can happen when something, some major events happens. Uh, let's say, uh, for example, today we can go to, back towards the gap when we have this press conference from Draghi, or maybe next week when we have Northern Perros report. But in either case, I think that euro dollar could come under pressure, under pressure to fill the gap. Okay, and if we will see a reversal to the downside to fill the gap, then this rally, this recovery will have even better signs of a corrective movement. Okay, so there are a few things, as I pointed out right now, that why I think that euro itself and structure is pointing us to the downside. The second thing is, as I said, the 10-year US notes. So if I bring the overlay chart, so here we have actually a daily chart of euro dollar. And if I made a correlation here with a 10-year US note, uh, we can actually see that markets are trading very similarly for the last, what, for the last two years or so. So we have seen an aggressive move to the downside in the second part of 2016. Then both markets, you can see here at the bottom, uh, actually found a, a low in December of 2016. And now, as you can see, both are trading some, somehow sideways since then. So um, I compared, when I have a clear euro dollar view, I also want to see where, what is the wave count for the 10-year US notes? Okay, so here I also have, uh, obviously, if I'm bearish on euro dollar and if this is a correlated market with 10-year US notes, then obviously I need to have a bearish wave count on 10 years as well. So here is uh, this wave count that I'm tracking. I believe it's pretty clear. Um, it's a zigzag uh, in progress to the downside. So we have here on 10-year first five wave development for wave A, then we have a nice but still complex three wave rally for a wave B, but you know that corrections like B waves can be complex. So clearly this was a temporary bounce. And if we are now in a new lag to the downside, another strong lag, then this wave C 
should be somehow similar to the wave A. So we also need five waves to the downside. And here I do not see five waves down yet. Okay, so here I believe it's a wave one, two, three, and now we have a nice free wave rally for a wave four and expecting a move to the downside for a wave five. Okay, so, and if we now consider this, then we can apply that euro dollar and actually 10 year US notes both suggest that we could continue to the downside. Uh, okay. Greg, you have that labeled as a four when it completes down there and re really great analysis. And you brought up non-farm payrolls and yesterday Mark brought up that the market isn't looking for the Fed to move in June, and maybe the NFP gives them reason, as well as the S&Ps being at new highs. Uh, very nice insight. So after we get down and we complete that um, five-wave pattern, do you think there's a chance for bonds to rally for all the way to new highs in a five? Uh, actually, the market could continue higher in a in a three-wave structure because I see. Here, on an even higher time frame chart, okay, uh, I'm actually considering this to be an ending diagonal in progress. Okay, so we could have new all-time highs in, in the bonds. And the last bottom in the uh, <clears throat> tenure happened on the Fed hiking rates, remember? Uh, yes, but actually what, we, uh, what it really matters to me at this stage is that once we will have a new low here, Okay, yeah. I would yeah. not say we are going to a new high because we must not go too far with the wave counts, with the wave, with the prediction. I always try to focus on a one wave at a time. Okay, and then right. when market unfolds, if I see that market is going my way, then I try to stay with uh, the, this my primary counts. But I'm always ready to adjust my wave counts. Okay, so this as uh, don't forget that any five wave movement when you think it's wave C, can also become wave free, which means you could, can get on also an extended five wave movement to the to the downside, like black wave free, not black wave C for counter trend price movement. Okay. I but see. what really matters is that once we will have five waves down here, that we should expect at least three wave bumps, A, B, C. Okay. Ideally, we will see a larger recovery back to bullish mode, but as I said, one wave at a time. So three wave bounce could, could occur. And when that happens, when I think that we will get lower into wave five and market turns, that's when Euro dollar could also turn to the upside from, from this wave five as well, which I think that we are going to see slightly lower levels before reversing. So actually, I think that Euro dollar could stay under pressure till the end of the year and then in let's say in 2018, I would watch out for a reversal. Thank you. Very concise. Nice, great stuff. Thank you. Anything else? Gregor, you want to show us from an Elliott Wave perspective the possible corrections of uh, the Euro crosses? Do you have them uh, prepared? Euro cross <laughs> um, I have everything. <laughs> uh, I can take a look at Euro again. But as I said, those gaps is really what concerns me, okay? So that's why I think that we can see a correction. Now, here is a um, very interesting count I'm tracking now. If some of the visitors are interested in long-term analysis, I just think that euro yen could stay sideways here. I'm actually looking for a triangle. But as I said, let's not go too far into the future with the wave counts, okay? So what really matters to me is that the reason decline on a daily chart was made in three waves okay so if you're familiar with the Elliott waves analysis then you know when always when a free wave movement or correct any corrective movement is completed you can expect that this movement this correction will be fully retraced which means that from minimum perspective we can say that market is headed back to 124 okay also the next thing is that this was clearly an impulsive reaction i I was posting and talking about this for FA members on the site as well. We covered this pretty well, and we said that euro yen could turn to the upside for, you know, for a new five-wave rally, and looks like that we have now five-wave movement, as I showed here on a four-hour chart, one, two, three, four, five. But this gap, as I said, is 
concerning. Okay, I don't think we will stay. It will stay open. Always uh, pullbacks will occur, and ideally we will see a new free wave setback, which could be maybe back to this open gap area, and then watch out for a new uh, turn to the upside. At least this is what I'm looking for. Okay, so if I'm if I want to put money in this pair, I would rather wait on a big free wave drop rather than put a risk here. Okay, and also there are some traders uh, which will uh, try to short this market, but definitely it's a dangerous game. But it can be some nice risk reward uh, trade if you spot a five wave fall on a smaller time frame chart. Okay, but that's not the case yet. So that's for your yen. Uh, also, I have another one. Uh, Euro Aussie, I think it's also very interesting. Okay, that's all done. I can close this. So actually here on a weekly, uh, I think it's a pretty clear pattern. Now always I'm, when I'm looking across different markets, scanning different charts, I always want to stop only at the markets with clear patterns. And that's definitely one of them. We have one, two, one, two, three, four, five, which means it means extended wave three, then you have a free wave retracement, then you have a new wave five, which completes the whole five wave cycle for wave A, and then you have a free wave retracement. What is the best part of this free wave retracement is that you had an ending diagonal, which is the most powerful pattern out there. We tested and spiked out this wave four level. <coughs> reversed higher we now broke this trend line so I really think that euro as it could stay um, could, could, could stay in uptrend here but they um, uh, Greg, uh, can I ask you on this euro Aussie since you have a view that's somewhat negative on euro looking for another decline is this going to be more about Aussie weakness than euro strength this year yes, I think so yes because okay. or if euro dollar will stay, let's say that euro dollar will not move straight to the downside, which is definitely possible. Uh, if you make more robust look for euro dollar, we are actually trading sideways for how long now? For yeah, a year more. and a half or so. Yeah. Yes. So actually, if euro dollar will stay sideways, not so bearish, even then euro as <laughs> could continue higher. So Thank I'll you. not be surprised. Okay. Dale, it's very interesting as you see, and uh, this is one of the uh, strengths of um, Forex analytics that you see that uh, Greg and I are watching actually the same wedge, but from a different yeah. uh, technical perspective. But it's, it's exactly the same thing as you see. I mean, it points to the same thing. Uh, and Greg, from what I see here in Euros, you have a C target, a potential C target of, let's say, close to 170. Do I see that right? Yes, definitely. If correction is done, we should go back above wave A. Yeah. So, so we're talking about huge, huge potential huge. after a pullback. Yeah. Yes, or, or also, if maybe like they uh, they ask me if this move higher will come from euro strength or or Aussie weakness. Uh, if we assume that euro dollar could maybe make a sharp move to the downside and and bottom because fifth wave is close then maybe Euro Aussie will just retest this support and turn to the upside, okay? So I don't think that Euro Aussie will make any strong dip. I think that even if this will be all about Euro weakness, it will still be support found here on Euro Aussie. And definitely, I don't think that we'll see any uh, prices around uh, from 2012 lows. Okay, do, do you have a Euro Kiwi as well? Uh, no, actually, I have to adjust the wavecom there, so I don't have any clear view, so I would rather not to show it. How about for people's retirement money, Grega? Where are you at on the S&Ps going into May? In the S&P 500? Yes. Uh, actually, I would stay on the sidelines somehow. There, I know that there is still a mania coming probably for stocks, um, but as things stand right now, as we see here, we are in some kind of a late stages of this fifth wave move up. I don't think that there is any good risk reward trades. Okay, uh, definitely there. If they are long for, for for let's say for the last five years or so, 
I would put money on the table, definitely. Okay? okay. And also, from a technical perspective, when it comes to basics of Elliott Wave analysis, we have here an Elliott Wave channel. That's the channel where you connect end of Wave 2, end of Wave 4, and put a parallel line on the top of Wave 3. And normally, fifth wave will find a resistance or a top, if you want, at this trend line. But in stocks, there is very common from history that stocks will top out after a mania cycle. A mania cycle could cause potential spike above this trend line and then a reverse to the to the downside. So it's not necessary that the market will stop here. Spikes are definitely possible, but once we see any aggressive buying here, I would be very cautious about the upcoming months for a reversal. Thank you, Gregor. Thank you very much as well. Great analysis. What a team, huh? <clears throat> I tell you, uh, you know, this is, uh, uh, you know, I've been in the business a long time. I've interviewed 700 people or so, and uh, I've never, uh, in my experience of being an educator or running trading rooms, etc., seen more powerful uh, combination that we, we have. There's Greg, there's Steve, there's Blake, there's Nick, there's Delios, uh, you know, there's Pinkert. It's pretty amazing. So, you know, I'm, I'm being, uh, I know that people probably say, you know, you're just saying that, Dale, because you're here, but I'm here because of this combination that is really outstanding. So, uh, great to have you, Gregor. You're, you know, always look forward to your analysis. And I think the first time we met, <clears throat> I was congratulating you for an award you won on FX Street. Can you uh, refresh my memory and uh, what was the award for last year? Actually, it was for 2016, I believe, or 2015. Yeah. That time is going very fast. Uh, yeah. it, I won the analysis score, the best technical analysis on the FX3 because uh, I'm quite uh, contributing there a lot, posting a lot of charts on the interday on. So it looks like that people just like my work, like what I do, because I'm, I'm trying to explain um, and present my view about the Elliott Wave on a simple, with a simple approach, because uh, a lot of traders, investors who tried Elliott Waves uh, are giving up on it because it's a very complex stuff, because you need... Yes, there's the always an alternate, 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 alternate. Makes <laughs> my head explode. Yes, but it's not about... Uh, I can also have alternate counts. I can have five alternate counts, but it's only the question of what kind of a setup you trade. Okay, it's not... The, the problem is that when traders are looking for the Elliott Wave counts, they want to be right on every cycle of every degree, but that's not possible. The reason why I'm looking at the wave counts at every cycle of every degree is to, to go down to the smaller time frame and spot the best risk reward trade that fits into a larger scale. But if this trend will change over the next few weeks, I will adjust. So I don't have issues to be wrong. That's the problem with the Elliott Wave traders that want to be right. I'm also receiving emails, Gregor, you were wrong on that. Gregor, you were wrong on that. Okay, maybe I was wrong, of course. But I never, trade. I never took a trade on that market. I was trading some other stuff. So it's actually another point. I'm just making the wave counts because I'm looking for trades, looking for probabilities. Where is the money? And that's the point. Trade the clear patterns. Well, you know, to win that award, Greg, uh, everyone in the industry wants to, I know from having, you know, been a webinar presenter and then Lar, everyone in the industry wants exposure and visibility on FX Street. So you're talking about, you know, hundreds of very competent, good analysts that are on there sharing their work. And for you to be given that award speaks very loudly of your work. And uh, I'm so glad to be part of the team that you're on, buddy. Yes, I'm very glad as well. And I just want that I will be able, because I'm, I have a, I'm very busy, but I will make sure attend your webinar more often in the future, definitely. Thank you, buddy. Thank I you. think Blake's going to be with us pretty soon. Is Draghi through taking questions? 
Anyone know? I, I, I think, I think uh, Blake is already on, by the way. Gregor, before, before you go, mate, uh, a friend is requesting if you can post or tweet your S&P Elliott wave chart. And another friend is also asking about uh, the Euro Aussie invalidation point having to do with uh, Elliott wave. The Euro Aussie invalidation point, that means for the short term, long term? Uh, obviously it means uh, they want to align to the long side, so they're asking what is the invalidation level that uh, you, you wouldn't be uh, or, or you wouldn't be anymore uh, looking for the upside. Actually, my invalidation that I would not be bullish anymore is here at 2012 lots. Okay. Really, I would I, I would really like to say that invalidation level is here at uh, those levels from uh, from February. But the fact is that that this okay. Yeah, obviously, I was not sharing the screen, right? <laughs> I wasn't. Now now I am. Yes. So I'm waiting. Yeah. I'm waiting because for you. Was, to okay, was, there we go. Okay, on the, on the chart. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so uh, actually, invalidation level is clearly here at 2012 flows because we know that when five wave move unfolds and you get a pre wave correction or seven leg correction, this correction can retrace even 100% of a previous five wave movement. Okay, so, so invalidation level is actually here, but when it comes to trading to my investment decisions or whatever, I'm trying to focus on a shorter term invalidation level because those gives you better risk reward setups. So as things stand right now, I would say that invalidation level, the shorter term would be here at 13650 around there. Okay, but if we see a breach of that level, then probably I would look for a decline for a way B to hit 78.6% if I put this one on. 78.6 okay so in that's in that case if we bridge this support I would look for 78.6 percent and then maybe look for a new opportunity from there but as things stands right now because we have five ways we can wave C as a set the validation level would be here that makes a lot of sense Greg and good morning guys hi hey, Blake hey hey morning, you know, I, hey, good morning, guys. I was, uh, you know, j just, you know, we, we had uh, discussed um, these Euro crosses in, 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 as a as a team, um, uh, obviously on the side. Uh, but you know, buying some of these pullbacks makes a lot of sense because we've had such good technical breaks. It's nice to see that uh, your LA wave patterns too match up with that same line of line of thinking, Grega. Yeah, that's great. It's perfect. Because that's something that we want to offer clients, right? To have yeah. one clear that they get confident about it. Exactly. Well, you know, Blake, I've noticed a lot of confluence between different methodologies on Forex analytics. Uh, I, I look for them. There, there are, and you know, you know, Dale, I know you've only been with our team for the last you know month or so, uh, but there are times. I mean, there are times where you know we we look at a. We look at an instrument, and you know, Grega sees one thing. I might see another, and Nick sees, you know, the same as Grega, or maybe the same as me and Steve. Even even doing technical analysis like myself, just basic technical analysis, he might have a slightly different viewpoint, and then we get you know conflicting signals, and that's part of it, and that's why, it, and it, it is it is obviously to the to the trader's benefit. Should we have um, you know more more confluence amongst you know different styles of trading and different types of indicators, and that's where that's where the strength of forex analytics lies, I believe. Yeah, and you know what, Blake? I've seen people have opposite positions and both be right based upon different time frames. Oh God, yeah. I, I you know, I, I would say, um, you know, for the last up until like uh, up until the the election. Um, up until, well, actually the inauguration really, uh, I, you know, I was bullish the dollar, but I'll tell you, even though I predominantly traded the dollar only on the long side, uh, you know, basically shorting the euro, um, you know, uh, uh, 
you know, shorting the euro dollar, buying the dollar Swiss, buying the dollar yen. That didn't. That did not mean that the dollar went up. And matter of fact, it was. You know, there was a lot of times where it was just range bound. And you know, yeah. I continued to make money, but people that were selling the dollar were making money too. It, so you're absolutely correct. It really big. It may. It it it, it really um, depends it's a lot. How you manage. It's how you manage the trade. Probably is as important, maybe even more, than getting directionality correct. Sure. Now, one one of the things I love about like uh, Elliott wave counts, and, and Greg, maybe you can expand on this a little bit, um, is that I'm a big fan, and everybody that knows me and knows my my type of analysis, I'm a huge fan of not buying into strength or selling into weakness. So I, I love to buy dips and sell rallies. And that's really the, you know, if you can think about that from a wave structure standpoint, that's where you can utilize Grega's counts, um, or if you're counting on your own, uh, to, to, to help you, to help assist you buying an instrument as it dips in price, even though you think that the that the the instrument is going higher in that case. Uh, so, Gregor, what are your thoughts about about that as far as counting? Yes, actually, Elliott wave is based exactly on that. That you need to level. At least I'm doing right. Uh, this is that I'm always trying to level the wave the wave count so that fits into the current wave structure, into the current trend. Which means if market is bullish and I see a pullback, I will always try to label this to be a wave 4 and will always expect more. Okay, and if we'll see then a new pullback, I will then try to label it as a temporary movement and then again expect more because we all know that continuation of the trends are, are a lot, okay, in one trend. Uh, right. While block formation or bot information is only one. So, See, simple as that. Stay with the trend, wait on a pullback, and always expect and be aware that market can continue higher. Don't judge the market because markets, as I saw, can always surprise. And you know that's such a great point. And and it so it, I guess the point that I'm trying to make and and what Greg is trying to make with you guys as well is that if you can get in the habit of buying a pullback or selling into rallies uh, if you're if you're bearish that's really the, the 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 basics to trading I don't I don't profess ever to have the the holy grail of trading but I will tell you that if there's a consistent message that I've heard in the 20 plus years that I've been trading it, you know doesn't matter what methodology you're doing doesn't matter what type of strategies you're employing if you just buy things when they're cheap or sell them when they're you know high, you know buy low, sell high. You just you know practice that basic premise. No matter what strategy you're doing, that's going to benefit you in the long term. You know buying breakouts and trying to play into momentum. You, 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 there are professionals that do it, and I know professionals that do it, and they do it well. But it is a tougher way to trade. It's a, it's a, it, because you have to be able to get out while that momentum's still going, and uh, most can't. Most, especially the newer traders, most of them buy into momentum, and they don't realize that the momentum shifted. But so by the time they get out, they're taking a loss, and uh, that's why buying on a pullback, using a count, a wave count, using a harmonic pattern, using a fib level to gear your your entries. When you know to to pick off a price as it's as it's dipped before it's about ready to go again, that has always been the the way that that most people have made money that I've seen over my uh, extensive time in the markets. Blake, Blake Tudor, Blake Tudor Morrow, like uh, uh, yeah, Blake like, all right, because, yeah, because that's momentum. what Paul's Speaking of momentum, Aussie and Kiwi floors have collapsed, and I, I see us getting momentum there. I don't know what's your view, mate. Well, you know, I don't. Well, that, that's the thing. I mean, I look at I look at the Kiwi, I look at the Aussie. They're breaking down. Like the Kiwi is is cleared support. The Aussie is clearing support. But the last thing I'm going to do right now is short them into that weakness. What I'd rather do is say, all right, well, let's let's let them bounce 
and once they bounce, if they bounce into, you know, they bounce into some resistance and it looks like they're going to stall, then that's the there where I'm going to take advantage of them. No, I'm with you there. I'm just saying that I think that uh, today's breaks, if confirmed, are uh, really bearish in the medium term at least. Yes, I would agree with that. I'd, I'd agree with that. And I think that, you know, you can you can play into the, you know, uh, you can play into those on the short side with the dollar or, you know, as as uh, as you had been talking about and 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 Grego was just pointing out too, buying some of these crosses on these dips. So, you know, whether it's the Euro New Zealand long or the pound New Zealand long, things like that. I think that, that's a different different way and, and possibly even a better way to employ uh, deploy against uh, some of these these uh, uh, hard getting hard hit commodity currencies. Yeah, and I agree with you, Blake, because that was my best call of the week was shorting Aussie and shorting Kiwi Monday. And uh, anyone that's chasing this weakness right now is going to have some problems. I think. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the the the, the thing. It's like you 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 have to catch a move. Uh, one of the one of the things that's really helped me out, um, uh, especially in my last, I want to say my last. 12 years or so of trading is when I really started to tailor my my experience around catching a move before it happens yeah. kind of like you, you you said hey the, you know the Aussie and the Kiwi is a good short it's like yeah you know what earlier this week the, the Kiwi was a great short and 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 rightfully so it was up you know it was up around uh, 70 cents and here we are at 68 cents so you you know, as a trader, you have to think about that from a value perspective. Like, okay, I'm shorting the Kiwi right now, but it's also, uh, it, it's also, you know, maybe about five per, or four percent lower than where it was on Monday. Monday. So, do, yeah, so does, does it, yeah, does it make sense for me to be on the short side right now after a four percent drop or a three and a half percent drop? I don't know about that. I, to me, it, to me, it's like no. I don't want to. I don't. I, you know, the, the people that were selling it on Monday were the smart money. You know. Yeah. You know, Blake. The only market you could keep buying new highs in for the last uh, five years is the S and P's. Yeah, it is. And and, and I'm sure I, tried to fade it. Yeah, and I have too. And and I'll tell you, it's a, it's a it's a it's a it's a very very tough game. And and the reason why is because of the the the, the we're so washed and. You know, quantitative easing and 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 so much stimulus and so much you know so much money that it's really kept the the, the capital markets afloat. Um, but that you know that's gonna that's gonna give way at some point. And 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 so, but obviously that that time isn't right now. But it but it will. And when it does, it's gonna be probably pretty spectacular. Um, yeah. But it obviously isn't the time right now. And that that's the the driver behind the markets. Obviously, yeah. that's been. I look forward to asking Mark Newton about it in about ten minutes. And, yeah, uh, yeah. So, uh, uh, Mark, I, I was, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say really quick for those of you that don't know, and and I'd like to. Uh, I, I actually follow him on um, Twitter. Hold on, Mark Newton. Yeah, at Mark Newton CMT. Yeah. Um, for those of you that don't know who Mark is and I've never met him in person I've only seen him on CNBC uh, from time and time again but I've been following him on on Twitter for a while we've maybe exchanged some tweets uh, at some point he's he's really a fabulous uh, technician and so uh, you guys are in for a real treat I mean these last two days Dale to bring in Mark Chandler um, Mark Chandler from Brown Brothers and then to bring in Mark Newton um, you know, oh, you, you know what, Mark, I have tomorrow? Mark of the Beast. Just kidding. Okay. Yeah, really, it's, it's, it, you guys are in for a real treat to have Mark Newton here. And, uh, and, and so, um, you know, I hope you guys, you guys, you know, ask some good questions and hopefully, uh, hopefully, um, you know, he'll give us some good insights on, on how he feels about the market. No doubt about that. So uh, you know, I, I just wanted—I actually wanted to pop in just for a few few minutes, and not there. There's really nothing for me to r report. I mean, I'm—I've been—I I actually traded the euro profitably today, surprisingly, um, because it's so choppy. But I've been just kind of scalping in and out of it. Um, you know, 
gold's not really going anywhere. The equity markets aren't going anywhere. We haven't seen any follow through from yesterday's move. Silver is still underperforming gold at the moment. Uh, bonds are pretty firm. Uh, the, the, the euro dollar spiked up, came back down, but the pounds, you know, holding near the 129 level, still in breakout territory. The euro pound starting to fall a little bit. The euro dollar, I, you know, even though it's, we've given back some of these gains, I wouldn't be surprised if the euro pops back up a little bit later. Because, frankly, you know, taking a step back and listening to the ECB and listening to Mario, Mario Draghi, rather, um, you know, he, he was pretty upbeat. He was, he was, it was, it was pretty upbeat. And I can't, I can't really figure out why the euro has come off the way it has. Maybe it's because of his comments about the lack of inflationary pressures. But overall, he was fairly upbeat. So whatever downside uh, that we're seeing in the euro dollar, I don't expect it to really stick around too long. I mean, we might we may pull back to 108, which is... I, I think it sold off on Greg's analysis. That uh, might have been... People got, people got word of it, you know, that Greg Horvat, he moves markets, so... You know that, that may have been part of it. That could have that could have been <laughs> it. That could have been it. Um, that yeah, for sure. Uh, but uh, as far as today goes, what I'm what I'm really going to keep an eye on is I want to keep an eye on equities. I want to see what they what they're what they're doing here. Um, everything's still really well bid. I mean, I'm surprised that the the, the equity markets uh, have shaken off yesterday's. Um, you know, we had the the we did get the buy on rumors, sell on news as far as the the tax plan goes, and I think there's the the lack of details and really the the uncertainty that 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 the Trump administration is really going to be able to push too much forward with uh, with w what they what they initially have given us probably. Uh, let the market sell off a little bit yesterday, but there's been no follow through today. So, um, you know, it wants new highs. It's got to print new highs here in the S. &P. Yeah, you know, I think the 2400 barrier in the S and P is not. I mean, it's very close, and it's uh, it's probably a, a a a big, big, big wide target for the market at the moment. So, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if we make our way up there, but. I I think the 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 risk reward to be long at this point is is you know pretty tough. It's a pretty tough argument to, to, to be on the long side of equities right at this moment uh, without another uh, reason to, to, to do so. And every reason that we've had to, uh, to, to push higher, you know, we're kind of, uh, we're kind of stalling up here. So I'm plus, not 100% convinced at this point. Yeah. And plus, you know, we're entering the negative seasonal period, so it may go away. I don't think you sell in May and go away, but I think there's a good short coming in May. And one of the reasons, Blake, I think we'll print new highs is the weakest sector in the S&P has been the oil shares. And I still think that oil has a shot to rally maybe two, two and a half dollars from here before we head lower. And I think that would be, uh, you know, enough jet fuel for the S&Ps to print new highs. Yeah, it, you know, it could be. And, um, you know, what's really interesting, too, I guess I, I might as well mention it because we're – we're here and we're talking about oil. The thing, the thing is, is if, you, if you do think that crude oil is going to uh, rally, if, the, if you're in that camp, you're with Dale, then the dollar Canadian is probably not a bad short at this point. Yeah. You know, the, the comments that came out over the weekend or over the weekend, overnight um, regarding, you know, NAFTA and the rene renegotiation of NAFTA, I mean, that's going to benefit the Canadian, should benefit the peso. There was a really wild reaction last night. I was, so I mean, I can't believe this stuff happens. Like you know, late at night when I'm at baseball games, and you guys are probably half. Most of you are asleep. You know, it's it's crazy because the volatility doesn't allow us to, to rest much. But I'll tell you, the dollar Canadian above 136. You know, this probably isn't a bad place to be on the short side because if it can close below 136, you know, I think we might make our way back towards 134. And if yeah. that's if, if crude oil continues to rally, I'm not playing the Canadian, and I'm not playing the peso right now. Um, thank God, because it is uh, it's 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 a bit uh, too volatile at this moment for 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 my taste. And Blake, not, I think uh, Nick Nick wants to show uh, a chart before Mark gets on. I, I saw her Skype something. So Nick, if you're here, uh, no, she actually know. asked if uh, if she should make a basic technical um, pattern in play. So oh, she's, she's not okay. here. I mean, she's, but oh, but okay. she's obviously going, going to issue a new pattern in play for the site. I see. Okay. 
Sorry, but that's, a, that's just a little heads up for for those of you that are those of you that are are, are Forex Analytics subscribers. Um, Dale, I, I probably I don't know if you've taken a break yet, but um, I I know you, yeah, so maybe you might want to give everybody a chance to run to the restroom before you bring on Mark Newton because I'm excited to hear Mark. Uh, I always uh, he's one of those very few people that when I see him on TV, I actually stop and listen to. So I'm excited to hear him as well. Okay, thank you, Blake, and uh, I will. I'll, I'll just run. Uh, I'll be back in about four minutes, everybody. Mark, I see that you're in the house. Thank you for taking the time today, and I'm going to make you the presenter in about four or five minutes. So that's your heads up. So stand by, everyone, for Mark Newton. At Mark Newton CMT is his Twitter handle. Stand by for Mark. Five minutes. Okay, I'm looking for Mark Newton. There he is. Hi, Mark. I'm making you the presenter, my friend, my trading warrior brother. Interviewed Mark once before on FX Street. So you have the controls now, Mark. <clears throat> Waiting to hear your voice. You got it, Mark? Hello, Mark. You're right there, buddy. No, it's not a volume problem. Hi, Mark. I made you. There we go. There's Bloomberg. Hi there. Hi, Mark. How are you, buddy? How are you? Good, Good. to hear you. Uh, you, have some, you have some fans in here. Uh, you know, the uh, Blake Morrow is a legend in his own right, and Blake follows your stuff. I, I always try and catch your segments on CNBC. Wonderful. Oh, know, thanks very and, much. Yep. And, you know, I noticed uh, last week, or the, uh, I think it's when I invited you, you had a tweet with, uh, I know you may want to start with what you have up here, but you had a tweet about the euro. Uh, yep. And you said that, you know, it looked a little, it could be a little shaky, and this was before the French elections, but it was right. still hadn't done anything wrong yet. So I'm pretty right. curious on what you're seeing here in the euro. And sure. uh, I notice all these different numbers. Is that Tom DeMarc stuff? Yes, it is. Yeah, no, I okay. use a lot of DeMarc indicators just for a counter trend type uh, methodology that I, I overlay to just a basic trend following approach. So, I mean, I, okay. I, I do a very traditional type uh, technical analysis, uh, you know, methodology, but I, but I also use a lot of counter trend tools. And so DeMarc really helps me to sort of pinpoint the highs and lows. And so... Yeah, you know, not uh, not to go through a lot of this, but but in general, when you see things like this green nine, you basically had nine consecutive closes that are above the close from four days ago, and so you can run right. that on days, weeks, months, and in general, it gives you signs of exhaustion. And the last couple peaks in the euro versus the dollar, you've seen nine counts right at the highs, and then also at the lows. And in this case, a more serious low, you've seen. You start off with this what they call a nine count or TD buy setup, and then you run you know, 13 consecutive closes where the close is beneath the low from two ago. And, and once you have 13 of those, and then you get your official buy signal, what's called a TD combo or TD sequential. And so when I see these appear in unison, then oftentimes they can be very powerful in marking uh, highs or lows. But, you know, my theory on the currencies at list for this year is that the dollar uh, should be in a peaking process whereby you know, we, we see the euro and pound sterling uh, start to turn up a bit more forcefully on a long-term basis because a lot of these longer-term cycles have historically bottomed uh, at about 16 and a half year cycles. And we saw decent bottoms back in 85, and then we saw good bottoms in 01, 2000, 2001 in the euro. And my thinking is that we are uh, on Under the verge the of a longer term bottom. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. you, you can see similar, you know, the highs have been made in, in 92 and also in late 07, early 08. And so 
we should be close to a time, and I'm not saying it's it's right here right now, but but I think that in general, the euro should be setting up for a bottoming phase, whereby yeah. we see a rally over the next seven to eight years potentially. Yeah, if I, the cycle I, you know continues. I saw that 2025 uh, year. Someone put out a tweet, you know, that's actually looking at um, uh, the euro going up until 2025. Uh, maybe there is one more. Right flush under par do you think that the parity guys can get one more yeah. uh, you know finally uh is that what you're looking for here is that i i had come into the year pretty bullish on the dollar into mid-year and then thought we would peak and so obviously uh you know things turned down almost right away and and it's been difficult i mean when i look at at uh, the euro i was thinking that we could get a final flush i'm not really enamored by the pattern all that much just yet i still think we're you know, within a downtrend, and for those that trade short term, I, I think that there is a good possibility that we we turn down and at least pull back down under uh, 108 and and fill the gap and and try to get yeah. down into 107. Uh, you know, but but obviously, you know, the battleground is is pretty set with regards to getting under 105.70 is is a pretty clear intermediate term sell for the euro, thinking that we're going to go to par in my view structurally. And if we can turn up and get above, you know, the more recent highs that we've seen over the last week, then uh, you'd also have to go with that on the upside. And that's more of a, you know, an intermediate term breakout type, you know, philosophy. So, so it's kind looking of in near the term, same, I think it's gone. Go ahead. It's kind of in the same position as gold is. Uh, gold was turned back yep. from uh, weekly and monthly channel lines uh, yep. in the last week or so. And uh, let me ask you this. I know you're a great technician, uh, but, you know, guys like Mark Chandler and our own Greg Horvat, yes. uh, they used the uh, two-year and the 10-year uh, note as uh -huh. a correlation with the euro. Uh, okay. So I, I was curious what you were seeing if uh, this bond rally is over and we get one more shot down in uh, the 10-year note rate yields up prices down while the yeah. S&Ps are blowing off to new highs. I, I think there's definitely a possibility that that can happen. I mean, you've seen a lot of the bear sentiment start to wane on, uh, on, on treasuries as yields have uh, pulled back a little bit. So I, I've been in the opinion that, that rates can still move up into uh, into the summertime. And then, you know, we see a pullback in the market between July and October, and that's a time when we can start to see that uh, – you know, the, the demand for treasuries come back and we can start to see uh, yields start to pull back. I think that, you know, right now the sentiment on the euro versus the dollar is very, very bearish. And we've seen that also on treasuries right near the peak, and, and that's starting yeah. to be uh, relieved a bit. But when you look at the short-term pattern, I mean, the real line in the sand is, is obviously this 230 to 231 level. Uh, I never got any real buys from a DeMarc perspective right near the lows, but it was an impressive move back up above this level, I, I'm a little more bearish on treasuries near term and thinking that we probably can start to move up, and that should also be uh, bullish for financials. Uh, right. I don't really see any real near term problems for equities outside of just being a little overbought, and uh, you know, sentiment still seems to be very negative, and, and some of that might be to uh, just the, the administration rhetoric and, and the scare that it's causing. Uh, you know, it's the same thing. I, I think we're into earnings seasons now, obviously, and uh, the election. Every major event that we've gone into seems to have been a chance to buy equities, where fear has been elevated. You know, right up before the uh, the event started, and uh, you know, the French election was really no no different. There, we saw. You know. Right around the time of the 13th of April, there were a couple different cycles that had shown the chance that we could bottom, and we saw the equity put the call rise above 90 yeah. on uh, that day of the 13th. And, and to me, the fact that equities really hadn't seen any weakness, but yet the put the call really started to spike was a real bullish signal that suggested that uh, it might be time to go back into stocks. And obviously the breakout in the S&P, uh, you know, in the last week has been – We've seen a little bit of a flight out of defensives, and we've seen structurally things have taken on a bit more bullish tone. You know, Russell 2000 has started to do very well against the broader market. And yeah, leading from a DeMarc that. perspective, I mean, we're still early with regards to any sort of peaking process by at least a few weeks. So I, I think in general, 
you know, we had a chance to sell off back in early March, and we just didn't really get there. Sound we didn't ways, hardly yeah. do anything. And so this consolidation near the peak, you know, nine times out of ten, these tend to be very bullish type movements. So you look at just the S and P weekly, and it's just tough to find much fault with this chart, you know, in my opinion. Uh, you know, momentum had waned a bit, but we just didn't do anything on the downside. The trends are still very much intact, and so I'm thinking at least another three to four weeks of higher movement, and there's some things I'm looking at in mid-May that could be problematic, but that's a good, you know, that's another... Well, you you mentioned July weeks. through October. What do you see yep. uh, in that time frame that makes you think that uh, people might come back to treasuries and equities may correct. Yeah, it's just a little, it's a couple cycles See, that I not, study, longer term things that, that are that are coming due and between July and August, and it also historically lines up with a pretty negative time for, for equities overall. And so, uh, you know, I'm thinking that we probably see some type of a peak in, in mid-July and, and, and turn down with a secondary peak potentially mid, either mid August or mid September, but the period between then and October should be pretty negative, and then we probably bounce into year end. But until we okay. see more signs of real deterioration, um, you know, I have more intermediate term concerns about the market only based on most of the monthly indicators that I track, and and just the fact that we sold off so severely into 2015 and turned a lot of these momentum gauges really yeah. the lowest levels that we'd seen in years. And so the snapback rally has gotten momentum overbought again, but we're really nowhere near the levels that we saw back in 2014-15. And that goes not only to percentage of stocks above 50-day moving average and 200-day, but I mean, the breadth was obviously much stronger a couple of years ago. And that's largely when the majority of the world also peaked out. When you look at things like the Bloomberg World Index and, and other things where you know, Europe not, peaked out in 2015, China did, and we're really not even back at those those peaks yet with regards to the oil point. indices. Great so point. historically, you look back at the major peaks in, in stocks, that being 2000, 2007, and, you know, these indices all peaked around the same time. This has been the first time that the majority of the world has already peaked, a lot of them in 2014, 15, but the U.S. obviously being the, the stronger engine of global growth, at least now, has continued higher and making new highs. But yet, could we still have little momentum of, issues. We only have about be, 60... Uh, Go ahead. Could that be because of confidence in the U.S. dollar, which might be near the tail end, that yes. just uh, dollar-denominated assets are in favor? So you buy the dollar, you buy you know equities, you buy U.S. dollar-denominated assets, and should we get that shift in the dollar that could be a catalyst for a shift in trend in money flow. Uh, that's likely. I, I don't. I don't necessarily use a lot of macro and or fundamental events and to try to pretend like I, yeah. I you know, can can predict the the sentiment shift. That's based why on you're better like than that. me, Mark. That's why I, I you're think, a better trader than me. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I, you know, like I, I'm more of a swing trade. I position trade. I don't do a lot of day trading or real short term, but I, I have a view you know, six to eight times a year that is very strong, and, and I try to stick with that and, and keep things on until they show signs of, of switching. And so I have always looked at the dollar index per se, which is what 60% against the euro right. is being still quite positive with regards to the longer term chart, but obviously signs of divergence, and we've seen a little bit of a sell off. And, and if we start right. to break down, then I think you have to respect that and think that this probably is the peak. But I'm we haven't gotten any real long-term sells, which I really thought would happen on a monthly basis, and really only need, you know, another push up, which would have severe divergence at that point, and would be a chance to sell into the dollar and think that everything else is is peaking. But uh, you know, you look that's, at the euro on a long-term basis, and yeah, that's the pound, a great and they're both still pretty pretty nasty and and ugly looking. But that's also the time that you know historically you start to see. I mean, the divergence is caused just by the sideways action that we've seen over the last couple of years, but there's really no buys here either on the euro, and we really need to go down one more time, and that would be a chance to really cover shorts and think that you get long and think that, all right, the cycle is, is likely going to start to 
you know, bottom out. But it, it's just tough for me to make. I mean, I have the longer term cycles that I look at, but but the short term obviously rules, and you want to adhere to that. And until you see sign of, uh, you know, either more strength of the euro or, or more weakness, I mean, it's just range bound. And if anything, right. we're up near a level now where I would be a seller of uh, the euro uh, against the dollar, and really a buyer of uh, DXY in general, and, and thinking that. You know, dollar yen could be starting to turn back up, and and you have one last hurrah where rates and dollar both move up, and that gold probably is sold, and uh, right. precious metals suffer, and then maybe into a June know, rate hike by the Fed. What do you think, Mark? I uh, I think they certainly have a window, particularly if if stocks can hold up into then. It, it's been much more Dow dependent than data dependent. It seems. I mean, right. I haven't seen any real you know, huge signs of, of strengthening across the board in the economy. If anything, the last month we've seen exactly the opposite, not only in the U.S., but across the world where almost everything has sold off in, in unison based on, you know, this is a Citigroup economic surprise index, and you look at this and the global looks the same way, where things were very strong since the election up into March, and then we got a couple of DeMarc cells, and, and we really fell off a cliff, and a lot of the economic data has actually been weaker than expectations uh, in the last yeah. month. And so that's, that's a very interesting, uh, very, you look at everything, Mark. That's uh, Yeah, I mean, I try to have everything line up. I mean, I want to find things that are correlated the strongest, and, and, and right. that's where I think I can add some expertise is when you see counter trend signals appear across the board on things that, that should be working, and then when they don't, and then you can add some value in thinking that. But, uh, you know, the so sentiment to me is, Go ahead. So talking about things that aren't working, uh, the weak sector, and I think that there's at least a bear market rally coming, has been the oil shares and oil, yeah. big break. Yep. And uh, to me, it looks like we're setting up for maybe a rally back to 51, 51 and a half, which should help the market because S&Ps are pretty heavily weighted with oils and they haven't helped at all. Yep. So what are you thinking here? I agree with that. I, I think crude, as of today, is making what they call a TD buy setup above what they call TDST support. And so that historically has proven very uh, actionable in trying to uh, fade the, you know, the, the move, which in this case is, is a downtrend from April as well as from early in the year. Right. Uh, I'm not enamored with the, the broader chart of crew, but for right now, it's really just a consolidation pattern, and you really can't make too much of this as being a, a you know point. a meaningful top. And so, you know, you want to see. For now, I'm a buyer of crude here, and I think that in general, energy, which has been the laggard and down what nine percent or so, and, yeah. and massively underperforming everything, likely can show strength, and it is a seasonal bullish time for energy and in general even though inventories are very high you still see the, the dropping off that, that historically is coincided with with energy starting to to lift so I, I look at a few different things and one is uh you know i i run charts of uh, like the oih versus the s p and so i run a lot of demarc signals on you know, everything to that regard and and you've seen a real you know, capitulation in uh, in this on a daily basis and even a weekly, we're getting down on a relative basis to the lowest level we've seen since last year. And within a couple of days of seeing buy signals on a daily basis, when you look at a a weekly, you're still a few weeks away from seeing that. You got, you know, you know decent bottoming last uh, winter, and we rallied also last fall. Now this shows that the OIH versus the S&P is probably – three weeks away and so I, I you know I'm trying to find some evidence that we can bottom and start to rally uh, still a little bit early from a traditional trend following perspective but the move in oil should start to stabilize and that in turn uh, you know could cause things to start to also trend up but for the near term I still think at 28 28 for the OIH I mean if you weaken down to 26 that's a big move uh, obviously, but we really need to see signs of reversing the recent damage that was done. We, we saw right. good buys uh, early last year on a weekly basis. Yeah. And, uh, I, you know, my answer is that you have to be really selective at, at this point, that, that uh, I'm, I'm more of a buyer of crude than I am for uh, than, than, than OIH. Than the shares. Than the shares. So, <laughs> you know, I, I've, no, I've noticed the same with the gold and the gold shares, you know, and I was always yep. told that the shares were – the leaders and they led yep. the way and gold shares 
haven't, re especially the juniors, have not been really uh, keeping pace with what happened with the gold on this recent rally. So, right, uh, no, they, they've been extraordinarily weak, and uh, you know, I, I uh, you know, I, I am still a little negative on on gold mining and, and gold shares in general. And so, you could probably get down to twenty one from twenty one ninety on the GDX, which for okay. the what is it? The JNUG is the one that everybody looks at for the the junior or something. That's uh, I mean, that's yeah, that's leverage right. ETF Not or it, something. Yeah. But that yeah. you know that's really interesting. That's gotten really beaten up badly, and so you're down to levels now where you know this is this is a more interesting setup on the junior miners than it is for the GDX for me, and and sort of an interesting spot. But you know, given my thoughts on on gold, um, you know. I, my, my thinking is potentially you get one more attempted move up in gold and then maybe that fail. We just never got any sales for gold here either, and so we haven't really broken down. Gold should be, you know, really a couple uh, a couple days away from at least trying to have a short-term type bottom uh, up here after this move. But, you know, we'll okay. see if that not materializes uh, at all. So here we are, 1262. So you get down near 1245 to 1250, and you would think about buying it for probably a last, uh, you know, hurrah, back to the upside, and then see. But and as you mentioned, I mean, the longer-term pattern is still pretty negative. Going back from 2011, there's a lot of overhead-type supply, and if the dollar starts to turn up along with rates in the next uh, month, then that should be, uh, you know, pretty damaging for, for this also. So gold got right to pretty key resistance here, at least based on this trend drawn from 2011, and uh, showing a few signs of rolling over. I think, okay. you know, until more deterioration happens and you want to at least initially be a, be a buyer, but that, you know, that also probably won't work if the dollars are going to turn up sharply along with, with rates. And so, uh, you so know, I, I, I try to make sure everything makes sense. And right now, yeah. you know, you're slowly seeing gold start to roll over. And uh, if my thoughts on yields and, and the dollar uh, materialize for a little bit of a lift into spring fall and then a, and then a peak uh, with peak and yields and, and you know we'll see what happens in, in the dollar but the, the dollar okay. seems to be at a real make or break overall and so it's really got to move uh, quickly um, on a, so on a you short mentioned, term. you ahead. mentioned the yen mark and uh, I'm interested uh, one of our a couple of our team members are pretty positive on the yen. I'm wondering what your view is and where you think uh, U.S. dollar yen could go to? Uh, you mentioned that it seemed to be turning up here. Yeah, it certainly seems to be on a weekly basis. I mean, we need to, to see a little bit more to, to think that we're really there. Um, you know, right now you look at, uh, and I, I I do make use of a lot of very elementary type trend lines, but when you look over the course of a few months' time, I think they're, they're you yeah, know, one of the more there. effective things you can use, I, I use trend lines and, and price and time more so than I use any sort of breakout or breakdown of commonly looked at momentum indicators, which I feel are, uh, are very difficult. But if you have a three or four month trend line that's taken out, that can give you all the signal in the world. So I, I do lean on a lot of the classical type techniques. So above 113 for me would certainly be a big buy on uh, on the dollar versus the yen, I think the yen should see further weakness. I mean, today's inaction seems to have gotten this going uh, a little bit more by the BOJ this morning. If you look on a daily basis, you see we got sells right at the peak, we got buys right at the lows on dollar yen. So just from a traditional uh, chart perspective, I mean, you get over these prior lows, and so that really is going to involve, you know, at least initially 112.20 above that 113. Uh, that would mean you've got a big move coming in, in dollar yen, I think, to the upside. Uh, and so we're not maybe, there yet. Maybe but, back to the old highs of 125, possible. Yeah, yeah. I mean, next couple of days are going to be key, and I think you, you you rally a couple of days, and then you sort of see what what you make of it. Uh, not the best risk reward necessarily uh, here, but I, I would still weigh in as as positive on the short term. Longer term, you see, you know, this chart that's really been ongoing for you know multiple years, if not, you know, the last couple decades with regards to uh, dollar-yen. And so I still have to sort of lean on that as well. And so that, we really peaked at a pretty key level back uh, two years ago in June. And, 
you know, we'll see if we get up there again and what happens. But, you know, obviously a break of this longer term trend going back since the early 90s would be, uh, you know, hugely Huge. bearish yeah. for the yen, bullish for dollar yen. And, and, uh, and I'm not sure if that happens yet. There's just not enough to go on. But, you know, well, we'll see, if it, we'll see if it does it bigly as our new president right. says. Big league or big league. <laughs> uh, Mark, uh, uh, just one more question. Um, what can you uh, do? You have any view on what on the VIX that we got that twenty five percent drop, and you know the VIX. Uh, you know I've read that um, there's huge net short positions because they've been making uh, they've been making money just selling any of the VIX derivatives for mm -hmm. you know months and years now, especially since mm -hmm. that spike on the uh, Chinese devaluation a year ago. Do you yep. think it's, uh, you know, I, I heard the same talk of about gold when it was 200, that gold didn't work anymore, it's an archaic relic. Is yeah. the VIX broken? Oh, I don't think it's broken. I just think you haven't really seen any signs of, of true fear in, in quite some time. I, I think yeah. you, you're seeing disgruntlement and frustration, and that's being seen by you know, portfolio managers globally, but, uh, you know, when the, when the equity uh, indices start to really break down, then you'll see uh, a flight to, you know, where implied volatility is, is, is scooped up in bigger fashion, but you haven't had really any, any reason to do that of late. I mean, these longer term trends certainly have held just since last year. They've been pretty precise yeah. and, yeah. you know, we if you see them move there. back over 17, then we're going to get yeah. to the mid twenties, probably the mid thirties very quickly. And so that's yeah. going to take uh, an S and P breakdown, which, you know, based on some of the longer term cycles, I think the market uh, should be in, in some sort of a topping phase starting this year in the next year. But, um, you know, the mass decline is right back at new highs and you just haven't right. seen any sign of real, you know, you've seen a little bit of deterioration in, in, in breadth just based on momentum, based on 2015, what I said, but just there's just not a whole lot, you know. And so if I start right. to see indices really break down, then you'll see your, your flight to quality. But to think the VIX, when it got to 16, was going to start a big move up when equities were only at, what, 23, 22 on the S&P, I mean, that's a little yeah. nonsensical. There's just no sign of any real volatility, you know. Yeah. We, we, we've, we've been in this range where, you know, I think the percentage of the number of down days that, are, that have exceeded one percent thus far and this year has been fewer than we've seen in almost a dozen years. I, a colleague That's of mine, uh, Ryan, what's his name, that went to LPL, he, he put out some decent stats on that and, and showed that the month of March had won and, and there's basically been hardly any. So, you know, we've been moving up since 09 and we've moved sideways really since mid-2015, even though the, the, the general trend has been up. But you've seen it's been tougher to make money just based on the sector rotation. And now you've seen volatility come to a, a standstill where the market goes in these violent two to three month upswings. And then you go sideways for four or five months and everybody sort of scratches their heads. And then the next big event comes along and people turn negative and draw down risk into the event. And that's typically a time to buy. Yeah. Um, Cause there, so is, there is talk that people are not buying portfolio insurance anymore because they feel like it's a waste of money. You know, Gradually, it, people have gotten more bullish. I think the one thing to lean on from a sentiment perspective that's really worthwhile to, to take a look at is the recent uh, Bank of America Merrill Lynch, the uh, global uh, portfolio manager survey, and, and the one for April that came out, and it had some pretty interesting data. The, the most shorted, or most short on there was the euro, which was really interesting. Uh, the, the percentage allocation to equities in general has gone from about a 5% overweight back in January, February of last year when equities were plummeting, and now it's up to 40%. So that, that's definitely crept up. People are, you know, begrudgingly bullish and invested. Yes. That's pretty big, yeah. However, the, the percent invested in U.S. stocks is a 20% underweight right now, which was I the see. least it's been since 2008. It's all going towards emerging markets Europe. in Europe. And yeah. so for me, that's interesting just because I've seen some signs uh, based on my own studies, and I pointed this out on, on Twitter, that, uh, you know, the euro, uh, the eurozone was starting to show real signs of acceleration versus the U.S., and there were decent right. signals of that, and, and that held true, you know, France and no. Germany were up, what, 3 to 4, 3 to 5 percent. And this is going back since 2015. If you pull it back on a longer-term basis, you can see, just how long that the, the eurozone really has been 
underperforming really since 2007 when the majority of global assets peaked the last time. And so you're, you're starting to turn, but it might have gone a bit too far too quickly just yeah. based on the sentiment and everybody now thinks that the Eurozone is gaining steam, and so this is an interesting signal that when you use these DeMarc signals, and they've come up now as 13 cells on the EZU versus SPY, which means that near term, Europe is likely a big underperformer in the next month, which means you short the VGK, yeah. you short the EZU, you short the FEZ versus being long the SPY against and thinking we're going to back off a little bit, and then you wait and see. Mark, what a great interview. Uh, you know. You opened my eyes to so many things. I really want to thank you for edifying the faith community and accepting our invitation. And hopefully, you'll you'll want to return and we can my do pleasure. this down the road. No, I'm I'm happy to do this, and it'd be great to get more people. I'm hosting my own call this afternoon, and, and I'm going to give details on that on Twitter. But my own website is uh, newtonadvisor.com, so I would encourage anybody that's interested to take a look at that. Okay, I so are you in our and, and uh, no, I just run a uh, consultancy uh, subscription-based business. I started my business a year ago, so I work with okay. a bunch of institutions, but it's also open to retail, and so anybody can, can get. I, I put out daily notes, weekly notes. I do a five-minute video every morning that I send out to subscribers, wow. and I also do a conference call, which just happens to be today at 1 o'clock. So I, I try to do it all as a one-man show and keep an eye on the markets at the same time. So. Uh, well, like uh, I, th I, like I think I think your work is amazing, and I've interviewed over 700 people. So, well, thank you very uh, much. That's a great compliment, Dale. I appreciate it. And, that. and uh, I, I want uh, to encourage people to check uh, Mark out if you're in the stock market, and you could see that you could. Uh, I asked Mark everything, and he answered everything. So, <laughs> uh, he, he, so he's got the holistic view of everything that's going on. Check out Mark Newton. Uh, his Twitter is at Mark Newton CMT. What's that? Certified magician technician. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly that right. What it, is? it means I have my own eight ball, and sometimes it works, and sometimes <laughs> it doesn't. But no, I, so you have to shake it extra hard. Yeah, no, I, I have. So I have a, 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 a private website for subscribers. It's under Newton Advisors, but but the one for the public is uh, Mark Newton CMT, and I try to cover okay. the global global macro environment, meaning technicals on stocks, commodities, currencies, and treasuries, and, and just give my, you know, my, my view and two cents as to how I see the world. Your analysis is very edifying. Thank you again, Mark. My trading warrior brother, uh, may uh, this year be your best ever. Thank you, sir. Well, I'm, I'm happy to join you whenever you'll have me, so I appreciate that. Have a great day. And thanks for everybody. Thank you, Mark. Okay, okay everyone, care. that's Mark Newton. One of the better interviews in the first month that I've been here at FACE. I hope everyone enjoyed it. And uh, we'll wrap up the week in my first month at FACE tomorrow. Everyone have a great afternoon, great evening, depending upon your geographic location. This is Dale Pinkert signing off from FACE. And remember, don't just count your pips, count your blessings. And we'll see everyone tomorrow to wrap up the week. TGIF, my trading warrior brothers and sisters. Adios.